Good to go. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rory Martirana. I am a reference and adult services librarian at the Ives Maid Library of the New Haven Free Public Library across from the New Haven Green. I'm joined by my colleague Megan Curry. She's the branch manager at Wilson Library in the Hill. And today we're going to be chatting with Gabriela Garcia. Gabriela is the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and a Steinbeck Fellowship from San Jose State University. Her fiction and poems have appeared in Best American Poetry, Tin House, uh, Iowa Review, and elsewhere. She's the daughter of immigrants from Mexico and Cuba and grew up in Miami. Of Women in Salt is her first novel. Oh, welcome so much. So happy to see you, Gabriella, and, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, so, so delighted to be here. Um, so for our attendees, if you have any questions for Gabriella over the course of our time with her, please feel free if you're on Zoom to submit those in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen so they don't get lost in the chat. Um, and if you're on Facebook watching us, you can comment on the video and that question should come through to us as well. Um, so just to start, um, this is such a powerful debut. Um, I'm wondering what the writing process was like. I read somewhere that you started out with this as your thesis project in more of a story form. When did it transform into a novel? How did that process look? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I started writing parts of it um, years, years before, you know, I thought of it, of it being a novel or, or a collection or anything like that. But I did write the bulk of it during my time in an MFA program in fiction. Um, and so, yeah, I formed my MFA thesis, but then was was published. And I think, you know, I think when I when I started it, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. You know, I some of those chapters sort of function as standalone stories um, and some of them don't really, you know, but I, I was just sort of writing as it came to me and um, I sort of did, didn't feel bound by sort of like defining what this thing was. I kind of just like turned it in and was like, you, you tell me what it is, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I like, you know, I like to play with structure a lot. I like to think about how, um, how stories can be structured non-traditionally. And, and that sort of was my process with it. In, in short, just writing it and then waiting for somebody else to tell me what it was. <laughs> mm -hmm. The book doesn't actually follow a linear chrono chronology. Um, the stories kind of jump back and forth in time. Did it, um, was that the intention all along or is it sort of like how the stories worked out? Yeah, so it doesn't follow a chronological timeline. It goes back and forth in time. Um, it, you know, the voices shift frequently. And I think I was thinking a lot about, you know, how, how stories are structured. Like we, we tend to think of um, traditional novel structure, like, you know, the, the rising curve of action, conflict and falling action. And that's, you know, based on ideas from like Aristotle's time, you know, Aristotle's ideas of, of, of novelistic and story structure. And I was sort of interested in um, disrupting that, you know, and, and thinking about other ways that stories are told. Um, you know, I think about the ways that my own family tells stories around the dinner table, you know, we'll start from one place and it'll shift into a memory and it'll go into, you know, something else and different people will have different interpretations of the same exact, um, narrative, you know, and that's always like really interesting to me. So I wanted it to feel that way. I wanted it to feel sort of the way that memory functions, the way that stories being passed from one generation to the other function. Like it's not um, a sort of sweeping generational historical narrative where everything is explained, where, you know, everything goes into detail with every single character backstory. There are glimpses, there are spaces where as a reader, you can fill in your own interpretation. Um, or link events together. And I wanted it to sort of function that way purposely.
so you wrote about um a lot about complicated mother-daughter relationships and it's with such nuance and, and subtlety um and i i mean i even found myself sort of relating to Jeanette a lot even though i'm you know never been an addict um just her relationship with her mother carmen in a lot of ways was very familiar to me to like um the way my relationship with my own mother was in my 20s um did your own relationships um have any influence on the novel was there you know is any of it sort of autobiographical in a way or um how did you come up with these these characters yeah so um so it's not autobiographical it's it's completely fictionalized but um you know i think i'm there's always going to be pieces of me in anything that I write, you know, or pieces of people I've known or um, situations I've encountered, images that have come from, you know, different parts of my life. So, so in short, I think there are pieces of me in it, even though my own relationship to my mother is very different, even though I'm really different from all of the characters that, that I write about. Um, but you're right, I, I wanted... I wanted to sort of depict some of the some of the real thorny complex relationships that exist between women and I think mother daughter relationships can be some of the most intense of those. Um, and I think, you know, I think I, I know for me, at least there there came a point in my life when I it seems, sounds so simple, but started to think of my mom as like an individual person and not just simply my mother, you know, um, to understand that she had her own life and um, relationships that had nothing to do with me. And I think that can be a really transformative point in, in anybody's relationship to their parents as they get older, you know. Um, and I think, you know, in the case of, of a lot of our, our parents, we just, we just don't know the full story of, of anything, you know, we have we only know them as the relationship that they have to us, um, which is a very, you know, small sliver of, of, of someone's entire being. Um, and so in this case, you know, the, the relationship between Jeanette and her mother, like she understands her mother in one way, um, but she doesn't have the full picture. And same thing with her mother, you know, her mother understands her in, in one very small way without knowing the full picture. And I think that's, pretty realistic of how a lot of, of relationships function in particular with our own parents. Um, I think that you had planned to read something, right? Yeah, I can um, read um, if you want at this point or, you know. Yeah, if you want to. Um... Okay, sure. Um, so I was gonna read, you know, speaking of mother-daughter relationships, I was gonna read from from a chapter um, that's in the perspective of Jeanette's mother, Carmen. Um, so I'm just gonna read from the beginning of chapter six, pray. Carmen was setting a bird of paradise centerpiece among the linen placemats when she heard the guttural growl, a persistent rumble that sharpened into an alarm. It sounded almost like Linda, her blue Siamese, when a bird in flight mocked the cat's predatory wiggles from the safer side of the sliding glass door. But this shriek went far beyond a pitch Linda could emit. This shriek had the unmistakable texture of wildness. Not that Carmen would have known. In Coral Gables, the wildest residents were peacocks. Lazy pageant queens traversing between parked Aston Martins on hedge hidden driveways. Carmen had been to a zoo exactly once, some 20 years ago, as a chaperone for one of Jeanette's elementary school classes. As far as she could remember, none of the lions had growled. Neither had the cheetahs or the white tigers. She'd found on a whole, the zoo an entirely forgettable experience. But she must have seen a nature show at least once in her 60 odd years, who could even remember their own age anymore. Because somewhere in her mind's gathered archives, an immediate connection formed. The noise came from a wild beast, 
a beast that didn't belong in the civilized world. She told guests to arrive at 7 p.m. It was three o'clock. The turkey glowed beneath the oven's lights crisping. She'd set all 15 places. Carmen had chosen a hybrid decor, the usual Thanksgiving stand-ins with some tropical flourishes. A cornucopia filled with cascading autumn vegetables nestled among marble figurines on a hallway table. Single lipstick red hibiscus blooms in crystal vases throughout the living room. Still clutching a few stray petals that had drifted from the centerpiece, she left the house in yoga pants and house slippers to investigate. Carmen looked up and down the street and the scene was as always. The street empty and quiet and grandiose, the banyan trees arched in a canopy like kissing lovers. Her neighbors tucked safely in their own houses or out already for early dinners. Ever since her husband's death, she felt ill even thinking of him, the pervert. She thought Coral Gables the loveliest and loneliest neighborhood in the whole world. Its faux Spanish street markers, its vine laden fences and stone gateways, all flourish, all enamel, hiding nothing, just persistent nothing beneath. She was about to turn back when she heard it again, another growl. It came definitively from the house across the street. How strange, she thought. Perhaps the single woman who lived in the house watched a loud movie, but not likely. She couldn't shake the weirdness as she showered, as she dressed in her dark blue Ralph Lauren suit, a suit she hadn't worn since retirement. And after she'd placed seltzer in an ice bucket to chill, after she'd laid out chips and cornichons beside her homemade pate, she crossed the street. She had meant only to knock, but Carmen startled at drops of what looked like blood, a trail from the center of the driveway to the door, a sprinkling of dark crimson she'd missed from the safety of her own driveway. She was so taken aback, she crouched to the ground and looked closer, as if blood could speak its truth if only she leaned into it. But she gathered herself and stood, forced her wild thoughts to heal. This wasn't a movie. She wasn't a heroic amateur detective, much as she loved those shows. Every window was curtained and there were no cars in the driveway. She braced herself and knocked, but nobody opened the door. She knew little about the occupant other than she was a single woman like herself, a woman with a grown child just like her, though this child was far more functional than Jeanette, a man who sometimes stopped by with kids and a wife in tow. The woman was like Carmen, but far less put together. And she talked too much. The woman let her gray roots sprawl. She wore pilled knit shirts and was often clacking about her garden in plastic flip flops, waving to Carmen with garden shears in her hand, swiping her forehead with a rag. She'd talk about her son, about how her daughter-in-law was lazy and clearly taking advantage of him and how menopause was killing her for God's sake. It was like the woman had no filter, no sense that some thoughts belonged in the hidden parts of herself. Carmen was about to turn back when she thought she heard footsteps, but no lights came on. The door remained shut. She put her ear to the wood and heard the slow hum of an empty house. And then almost imperceptibly, a long sigh, like a dog curling into sleep. No, not a dog. The footsteps rang heavy, the breathing, not a pant, but an audible purring like Linda's purrs, but through a stethoscope, magnified, huge. For a moment, she had the irrational idea that a house might have a living, breathing soul, a heart trapped among shine polished appliances and old inherited furniture, bursting to be known, perhaps bleeding into the street. She stumbled back from the door, then crept forward again, put her ear to it again. Yes, purring.
That was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gabriella. That's actually my favorite chapter. This is Megan, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that pray is my favorite chapter in the book. Um, so we actually have a question in our Q and A, and if anyone has any questions for the Q and A, feel free to type them in there, and we'll we'll uh, field them to Gabriella here. Um, so uh, Vito asks, uh, reading your book reminded me of the seminal Cuban director Umberto Solas' film Lucia. Uh, this followed the lives of three Cuban women named Lucia over the course of different periods in Cuban history. Uh, on another note, what are your thoughts on normalizing U.S.-Cuba relations? Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, I'm, I haven't seen that that film, so I'll have to check it out. Um, thoughts on normalizing U.S.-Cuba relations? Um, I mean, I I would love to see U.S.-Cuba relations normalized. I, I travel to Cuba all the time, and I grew up traveling regularly to Cuba, um, unlike, you know, the character of Jeanette, who has this sort of complicated relationship. Her parents don't really want her to go to Cuba. I didn't, I didn't have that kind of dynamic growing up, even though a lot of people do. I went regularly. I'm in touch with um, friends and family in Cuba on an almost daily basis. And, you know, it's been, it's been sort of challenging at different points um, in, in the past decade, you know, kind of just depending on who's who's in power, how difficult or less difficult it is to travel to Cuba. Um, so I would, I would love to, um, to see relations normalized, to have an easier time traveling there, to um, have more, you know, open exchange between Cuban, Cuban writers and filmmakers and everyone and, and um, U.S. artists. So that's my stance on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and so I, I'm curious, uh, my, my main question is, I, I love that you're following this intergenerational kind of saga of this, of this family, two families. Um, why, why did you choose uh, to kind of break it up? So you, you have Maria Isabel as the starting uh, off of the book, and then you have her daughter Cecilia, which we don't really get her story. She's an infant, um, and then and then it breaks. Um, and I love that you created that little timeline in the beginning of the book. There, it was fun to follow. Uh, and then you have Dolores, and of course Carmen and and Jeanette. Um, what was your choice there? Did you want to write more, or or did you hold hold yourself back, or was this on purpose? Yeah. So I think again, I I didn't want it to be like a a sort of traditional sprawling um, historical epic, you know, um, or like the kind of intergenerational novel that follows every storyline in depth. Um, I was sort of more interested in capturing glimpses of some of these of these people and most interested more than anything in the sort of echoes or connections that existed between those generations, the ways that certain things that, you know, um, a subsequent generation didn't understand about a previous generation might might affect their lives in really tangible ways. And so I was sort of interested in those parallels in, in the ways that um, all of these women sort of followed similar trajectories in some ways, or there were like disruptions in their narratives because of very like specific conversations or things that happened. Um, that was like what was most interesting to me. So as I was writing it, I was sort of I was less, you know, trying to think about these lives in, in full, as in what, what I was drawn to, what pieces were um, most relevant to me or would fill in a sort of hole in understanding the larger narrative and understanding all of these women together, you know, as I was thinking about what to include in each chapter. I was wondering, so the, the phrase we are force is it recurs a lot in the novel, especially towards the beginning. And then again, it comes back up at the end. Um, and it seems to transcend all the generations within that, within that book. Um, what was the um, significance of that phrase that you wanted people to really pull away? Because many of the characters repeat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I came across that, that phrase and, um, 
in that letter from Victor Hugo to uh, women of, of Cuba, which is a real letter that, um, that I came across years ago when I was traveling to Cuba at a museum exhibit. And I was so, I was so fascinated by that letter and by all of that correspondence between um, this author writing to independence fighters and workers at the time and that kind of interplay that existed between literature and class consciousness and the political movements of the time. Um, that was so fascinating to me, you know? And then the phrase in particular, I mean, I think what I liked about that phrase is that it's, it, it can mean a lot of different things, you know, it's sort of ambivalent, like force can be, you know, strength and, you know, just like a force between generations of strength. It can also, you know, pertain to people being forced into certain circumstances or um, having, you know, a, a, an element between all of these generations that can't be like fully tangibly describe just a force that exists you know there's just so many different ways to think about what what the word force means and what we are force can mean and so I was I was interested in that I was interested in how the very same words and the very same book that is passed along from generation to generation can mean really different things to different people you know um it's this really significant thing book to to the first woman, Maria Isabel, that sort of opens up her world and, um, you know, shapes shapes so much of her life. And then later on for Jeanette, it's like a book that she sees as a means to like possibly sell and, you know, use that, use that money. And, and then, you know, it, it sort of has another kind of ambivalent meaning to um, Anna at the end of the book. And so I, I kind of wanted to capture the ways that that these stories, that these phrases can mean very different things to different people. Victor Hugo's, um, his novel Les, Les Mis is also, it makes several several appearances within the book and it's, and it's so important to so many of the characters. I was wondering, did you choose that title intentionally because of, I mean, some of the stuff that happens in that book if people aren't familiar with it, like a lot of people struggle and um, and it seems, you know, to have some similar themes to the book you've written. Yeah, um, I mean, I maybe in part, I also, when I was writing that early chapter that takes place in the cigar factories where um, lectors are reading books to, to the people who are rolling the cigars, I, I sort of looked at what what were the actual books and which ones were most popular um, that were being read at that time, and you know a lot of the the cigars to this day carry the names of some of those books that were so popular in the cigar factories. And Victor Hugo was a very popular author, um, and Les Mis was a very very popular novel. So so you know that sort of just came out of being true to like the the history of that. Um, but I also chose that book because I was very interested in that direct correspondence that was happening between Victor Hugo and people in Cuba, um, which to me opened up all of these questions about the function of literature, about um, the connections between literature and politics and history. And, you know, um, it seemed like a really good sort of opening to some of those larger questions and themes that come up throughout the novel. Gabriella, we have another question in our Q&A uh, from Arthur. I really enjoyed reading this book and was wondering what types of writing and authors influenced your writing of this novel? Yeah, so many. I mean, I read, I read very widely, you know. Um, I read a lot of poetry too, in addition to fiction. Um, but I think in particular, when I was writing this book, I was, I was reading a lot of books that just feature women and relationships between women and um, complex and complicated ones. Um, and I think I've just always been drawn to, to stories about women and, and you know, some of the, the best writing, I think in that, in that regard, like I read a ton of Toni Morrison, for example, who I think has some of the most interesting um, explorations of female friendship, of 
mother daughter really complicated relationships. Um, so I read a lot of Tom Morrison. Um, I revisited Sylvia Platt's The Bell Jar, which again is is a, a book about a lot of connections be between women that are super interesting and complex. Um, I read a lot of Elena Ferrante. If you're not familiar with her work, um, this Italian author also features almost all, all of her novels um, are about women, relationships between women, friendships, mothers, daughters. Um, so those are, those are some of the books that I was definitely thinking about. Are you working on anything new or are you still kind of enjoying the reception of, of the book? Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been a super busy time since the book came out um, with a lot of publicity and a lot of, you know, media facing stuff. So I've found it hard to be in a sort of quiet space to, to focus on my, my writing and my creative self, but I've been working on shorter things, you know, I've been working on poems, like I said, I, I write a lot of poetry too, and um, revising and reworking some short stories that I haven't published previously. So that's sort of been where I've been at, but I am hoping to start on a, another novel, larger projects soon, in the next few months. Do you have any plans to release your poetry or is that something you just do for your yourself? Um, I have, I mean, I have several poems that have been published um, in different, different journals and I have a poem that came out in um, Best American Poetry a couple years ago, which is a great anthology. Um, I don't have like enough poems, I think at this point that I would collect into a collection, but I hope to maybe get there some, you know, someday. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, yeah, no, this, this book reads like poetry. It's, it's beautiful. It really does. Yeah. I love it when that happens. Look yes. Up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. So Gabriella, we have another question in our chat from one of our viewers. Uh, this is from Martin. Uh, what is the significance of salt in your title? Yeah. So again, I think speaking of poetry, like I think of, of, um, I think I, I titled my book in much the same way that I title a lot of my poems, which is rather than it being like a literal definition, a literal title drawn from, um, you know, a phrase in the book or anything like that, I was sort of thinking, you know, going through the book and looking at images or words that came up frequently. And salt was one of those elements that came up multiple times. Um, and similar to what I was saying about, you know, the phrase we are forest, like I love words and phrases that can have many different meanings that can be looked at from different angles. And so salt was like that, you know, it can refer to the ocean and um, which obviously has a role to play in the book and that separates, you know, these two, I, you know, these two countries and all of that, um, you know, salts it also has these connotations that have to do with like body and sweat and you know so I loved that it could sort of mean all of these very different things and I knew I wanted women in the title um and I really liked the sound of women and salt in conjunction and all of the different kinds of connotations that can bring up since you brought up women um Something I really love. Also, I just have to say, like, this was so well written. I haven't had a book make me actually weep in like a million years, but this, like, I was sobbing at the end of it. Um, and I really love that when it really makes you feel stuff. Um, something I really enjoyed about the book is how you stuck to the, um, the stories being told by women. They told, like, you know, the women tell their own stories and they kind of all feed into each other, but they're they're very raw and open and they're speaking very vulnerable truths. Um, and it's even for ca characters like Carmen, who seems to be a bit more guarded and more interested in how people perceive her on the surface. Um, I'm wondering uh, what, a, what inspired you to approach it that way, um, if that was an intentional choice. Yeah, so it was definitely intentional. Like I wanted it all to be um, in the voices of women and future women. And even though 
their characters who are not women they're sort of always at the periphery or you know I didn't really delve into their um psyches and I think I mean I think part of my interest is that I I grew up around women you know I I grew up with a single mother um I grew up with my grandmother my mother had all sisters my grandmother had all sisters I have all sisters so I just I grew up around a lot of women and not really any any men but I never felt a lack in that at all you know um I felt like I just I had such support from from all of these women who came together to support each other and so you know I think that is part of why I was interested in looking at you know a family and a community and those bonds that existed solely between women and sort of also just the ways that all of these women are surviving within these often you know patriarchal circumstances um how that forges bonds between them how that breaks bonds between them you know i was i was really interested in that So we have another uh, question in the chat from Vito. I visited Kamagwe in, I hope I said that right, um, 1989, and it is one of my favorite provinces of, in Cuba. I am intrigued by Los um, Tinajones de Kamagwe. Uh, what is your connection to Kamagwe? Um, yeah, so my, my grandmother and her family uh, are from Gama Way, even though she grew up in Havana. But um, yeah, I, you know, I've visited Gama Way, and that's where you know a lot of my family's roots are. So, um, I, I mean, I have family from all over Cuba, Havana, Pinar del Rio, Gama Way. But um, yeah, I grew up hearing, you know, hearing a lot of stories about Gama Way, and um, you know, I've also done a lot of that drive, and so a lot of that was that, you know, on my mind as I was thinking about moving between the city and the more rural parts of Cuba as I was writing this book. So we had, um, I think Megan had come across an article that mentioned, do you have a background in migrant justice work? Um, so we were curious if any of your past experiences with that and hearing stories from from those people and also from like immigration stories from your own family, how much that might have influenced or informed your writing of the book. Yeah, so um, so yeah, it's true. Before I entered my MFA program and sort of started writing full time, I was working as an organizer for many years. I worked for feminist organization. I worked for um, a few, a couple of migrant justice organizations and um, there's a part in the book that's that takes place in a detention center in Texas um, that's sort of drawn from from work that I was doing and conversations that I was having with women who are in a, um, a couple of two different family detention centers in Texas that I visited regularly. Um, and yeah, there are actual pieces of that chapter I started writing, you know, before I entered my MFA program when I was still doing that work and before I ever thought that any of this would be published or become a book. Um, it was just sort of writing that I was doing as I was processing the work that I was doing. Um, but yeah, that that certainly, you know, bled into some of my interest in, in writing about, uh, you know, and featuring a, a detention center and sort of some of that process. Um, and I was doing that work. I mean, I was doing that work years and years ago before there was the sort of national attention on um, detention centers that happened, you know, shortly before my book came out. Um, at that time, when I was doing that work, it was like, so difficult to get any kind of media attention. Um, even though, you know, all of that was was happening, there was, you know, still family separation and still these really um, horrific family detention centers that were being built and you know popping up all over the country. How much how much research was involved um, aside from you know hearing stories firsthand from 
from other people? Did you have a lot of research to, um, to get this stuff right? It's a lot of heavy topics. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of that is drawn directly from that work that I was doing at that time, those, those chapters in particular. So, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't involve a ton of research, but I was also, you know, at that time, just constantly in contact with lawyers and with other organizers. And I was just like very deep in that, in that world. Um, so, you know, I had a lot to sort of draw on when I was writing that chapter. Um, I definitely had, you know, some of, some of the people that I've organized with and some of the lawyers that I'd been in contact with, like read parts of that chapter and were really helpful. But um, yeah, a lot of it was drawn just from that, you know, in-person work that I was doing for years. So just once more, if anyone has any questions for Gabriella, you can submit them in the Q&A, or if you're watching on Facebook, you can make a comment on the video. Uh, I, I did also want to talk a bit, and you mentioned this a little while back, about your use of narrative voice and how you play with narrative perspectives. Um, some of the characters speak to us from first person um, consistently, and then there are others that are consistently third person or back and forth. Um, Jeanette and Carmen in particular, they seem to flip back and forth between first and third. Uh, I used to teach English, so I could probably just be reading too much into it, but um, something I picked up on was when Jeanette is assaulted, the narrator's describing her thoughts and saying how she couldn't find her voice. Um, was this an intentional change in the narrative voice to add to characterization um, for these people? How did you come up with that idea? Yeah, um, thanks for, for noticing that. Yeah, I think I, I put a lot of thought into voice and point of view and perspective as I was writing this. Um, and I wanted, I wanted every chapter to really feel like stylistically different, you know? And I think, and you know, I wanted to shift um, points of view even within the same character, depending on sort of what is happening in each chapter. So for example, you know, um, one of the first person chapters is one of Jeanette's later on in the novel when she's sort of descending into addiction. And, you know, that part that part of the writing is a lot faster and it's sort of the the rhythm is a lot more frenetic and I sort of wanted to kind of match what is happening in that in that part of the narrative you know for it to sort of feel the same way that it's happening um other chapters you know even when they're in first person like um Gloria's chapter in the detention center you know I I think that could have easily felt very like melodrama or like claustrophobic you know I wanted to sort of have enough narrative distance that it wasn't you know manipulatively sentimental or something like that um there are you know I, I was thinking a lot in each chapter about how much distance to have between the character and what is happening and um and you know point of view is one of those avenues that can kind of create that that feeling you know and I played around with it a lot. Like there are some chapters that I switched from, you know, third person to first person and eventually ended up switching them back because I, I liked the original effect. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot about, you know, sound too when I'm writing and I like, I, I think about feelings, you know, I think about how just things like narrative perspective can affect how a text feels so deeply, you know? Um, so yeah, I appreciate you noticing that because that's definitely something I, I think a lot about. We have another question in the Q&A. Uh, Jay asks, how has your book been received in Cuba? Uh, do you work with Casa de las Americas? Yeah, so I'm familiar with Casa de las Americas because my, um, my aunt, who's a professor of, um, of Latin American and Latino studies, does a lot of work with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately, because of the embargo, there's really no uh, literary exchange with Cuba. So my, you know, my book being put out by a US publisher, like it's not available in, in Cuba. I 
keep catching like myself on mute. Sorry. Okay. I wanted to um, that chapter that you read from the that's the Thanksgiving chapter. Um, it seems like it's so pivotal to the whole novel. Um, did you was that an early one or is that something that came later? It seems like it ties a lot together. Yeah, so even though um, the book sort of switches back and forth in time, I actually wrote it mostly chronologically the way it appears in the book, each chapter. And I think, you know, I sort of thought about what information to reveal at what points and that chapter, you know, sort of, um, yeah, bring, bringing in a lot of different, different elements or unanswered questions. Um, you know, as I was thinking about each chapter, I would just sort of think about what narrative holes there were, what, you know, information needed to, to come in at that point. Um, but yeah, sort of wrote it in the same, in the same way that it appears in the book. What are, we kind of talked about this a little bit, um, but when you're writing, I know some writers, they have like special playlists or um, certain things they like to listen to. Do you have a certain ritual that you follow or it's sort of like, do you plan time that is scheduled or just kind of wait for it to come to you? Yeah, I'm always so jealous of people who have like a really disciplined practice, you know, wake up every day at a certain time and just sit in a special chair and like write for hours. Um, I have a pretty like undisciplined writing practice and, you know, I'll, I'll have like bursts of writing for days and then not write for weeks. And, you know, it's sort of very um, chaotic like that. But I would say if there's one, one, way that I that I found myself writing a lot of the book it was in cafes like I love um working out of cafes and just that ambient noise and you know people walking around but just sort of focusing on my writing which you know it's been hard during the pandemic because that sort of is one of the things that I really really miss doing um and that I found really productive for me you know getting out of my house, going to a cafe, writing there. I find it really hard to write in my house for some reason. Like I just end up cleaning or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> mm -hmm. so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Carolina asks, you uh, describe the act of writing as very difficult. Uh, could you please give us a, a sense of the process of publication? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I think publication process can be so different for, for everybody, for each person has a really different path to publication. Like mine, you know, sort of happened in part um, because I won an award when I graduated from my MFA program. I won a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, which um, sort of, you know, a, a lot of different agents are sort of talking to people who, who have won this award. And I sort of kind of, you know, found an agent and, and went into the process of selling the book before I had even thought I was ready for that, you know. Um, but I was, I was very lucky to have that sort of uh, attention early on. Um, but yeah, it took about two years from the time we sold the book until it came out. Um, and that that time was basically editing and revising and working with my with my editor. I don't know if that answers the question or if there are like specific questions about about the publication process. I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, by Jay. Uh, I was interested. In uh, that the topic of machismo is never discussed directly. It seems that this was a goal of the Cuba revolution and to some extent it was a, has been eradicated. In your book, it seems some men attain a revolutionary consciousness, but not on a domestic level. There was an old saying, in la calle che, in la casa pinoche. Mm, that's a really interesting saying. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I don't, I don't know that, it, that I can think of any um, country or society that has eradicated patri patriarchy, you know, um, or misogyny. So I think, and I think that's, that's true across like so many different kinds of, of government structures and, and political movements and, you know, even left political movements in the US. Um, so, so yeah, I, I was interested definitely in those tensions between um, people's political consciousness, but how that actually plays out in terms of gender relations and like domestic spheres. Um, but more so than like, delving into the consciousness of men or even of like how those dynamics play out like I was I was much less interested in that in just more so thinking about women and how they survive and make lives despite you know the the structures that they're born into um and how how the relationships between them like sustain or break some of those patterns. So that's, you know, if if it's not directly discussed, I think that's part of why, because that was less interesting to me than the women. And another question from Vito, are there any contemporary women Cuba writers you connect with? I'm a big fan of Nancy, uh, I believe it's Mori Yon, is that right? Nancy Morejon, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's it's hard to get Cuban Cuban writing uh, from Cuba here. Um, but there, I think there's a book recently out. I think her name is Carla Suarez, um, or at least it came out in the UK. Maybe it hasn't come out here yet. I'm not sure. Um, but she's Cuban, and I really enjoyed that. Um, City Lights has like an anthology of, of poetry from Cuba, from writers in Cuba that I've really jived with. Um, yeah, so those are a couple of recent, recent ones. I'm curious, have you always wanted to be a writer? I've definitely always been writing my whole entire life, you know, since I was a child. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it took me a long time to sort of approach it professionally or to think that I could publish a book. I spent about a decade, you know, working various jobs before I um, decided kind of on a whim to apply to do MFA programs. And I just thought, you know, if I, if I get in, then I'll like, you know, try to pursue this professionally. And if not, I'll just keep writing for myself. Um, so yeah, I think I've always been a writer. I don't, I don't think that I ever thought of it as an actual like career path um, until late later in my life. You know, I was in my 30s when I started my MFA program. Um, so I was working for like a decade in various sort of writing adjacent jobs. Like I always, you know, even when I worked as an organizer, I was writing um, and I did some like nonfiction writing and things like that. But it was always sort of adjacent to actual, you know, creative writing, which is what I ultimately wanted to do, so. In the process of doing um, press interviews and, you know, author talks like this, uh, is there anything that you, about your book that you totally expected um, readers to pick up on and ask you about that they haven't? And conversely, are there, any major takeaways from readers that really surprised you? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, I mean, I think one of the maybe surprising, but, you know, exciting and fun things has been hearing from so many different readers who every person seems to just like connect to one of the women in the book in particular, you know? Um, and sometimes I just get such different, you know, like somebody will say like, I really, really like just loved and connected with Gloria. And like, I wish there'd been like five more chapters from Gloria's perspective and somebody else will, you know, say they really loved um, Jeanette and wanted to hear more from Jeanette. So I feel like that's been interesting to me, just seeing how, how much everybody sort of connected to like one particular thread or person. Um, 
on a really personal level. And that's, that's gratifying too, just to know that, that people have such strong like feelings towards these characters. Mm -hmm. We're nearing the end of the hour. So if anyone else has any questions for Gabriella, feel free to get those in. Um, what's it been like, um, you know, the whole process of publishing and promoting the novel? Um, has it been strange and surreal? Has it sort of sunk in yet? Like, this is my book and, it, you know, people seem to love it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been, it's been, beyond my wildest dreams for the book to find this many readers to, um, you know, for, for people to connect with it so deeply. And that's, of course, incredibly gratifying. Um, it's been, I mean, it's been a kind of whirlwind in some ways and in other ways not. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the book obviously did really well and, and you know, it's a, it's a New York Times bestseller and has found so many readers, which I'm so grateful for. Um, did a ton of press, but everything has sort of happened under, you know, the pandemic and lockdown and mostly just sitting behind my computer, you know? So I think for a long time, it sort of was hard to grasp that this wasn't even just like a figment of my imagination, you know? It wasn't until like many, many months after publication that I even went to a bookstore and like saw it in real life and was like, oh, this isn't just like a made up thing in my head, you know? Um, but yeah, it's been, you know, I, I'm a pretty like sort of introverted person. So I think having this much public facing stuff, having this much media attention has definitely been an adjustment, you know, and sort of having to find the balance between that, and, like the quieter creative parts of myself um, has been, you know, has been a challenge, but um but ultimately, like it, it is really rewarding to just, you know, see the book connect with with so many readers, um, even if I don't get to see it in real life that often, but I feel it. One more question for you. It's sort of a, a writing question. How um, how do you know that you're done? And were there pieces or maybe stories that you originally included that you might have cut? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the question of knowing when you're, when you're done is, I, I haven't even like really figured out the answer to that question, you know, sometimes um, I feel like I could work on something forever. And I've been really lucky that I've had, you know, people who sort of told me like, this is done, like, you know, we need to publish this, um, because otherwise I might just work on it for years and years and years. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know that I, that I know when something is, is done, but I do think that for me as a, what I have found really useful is just taking a lot of space between, um, finishing a project and deciding to go out with it or show it to other people. You know, I think sometimes when I finish something and then spend, you know, sometimes several months away from it before I, I try to revise it again. Um, that is really helpful, you know, to look at it with sort of fresh eyes when I've kind of forgotten it in a lot of ways. Um, I think that helps me have a much more, a, a much deeper grasp of a writing project than when you're really, really close to it. And, um, you know, you're too close to it to really see what might, what might need to be revised or rethought, you know? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Gabriella. It's, this has been a, a great talk. I want to just thank really quick everyone for attending. We just have a couple of housekeeping things. If you enjoyed the discussion, please take a moment uh, when your Zoom ends to complete the web survey that will pop up in your browser. Um, this is really helpful to feedback informs our future program offerings and you know we were hearing a lot from the the latinx community that we haven't really spoken to a lot of of the writers from their community so i mean gabriella wouldn't be here if, if we didn't do these surveys so it would be great if you could fill that out um, we invite you to join uh, mitchell and wilson branches in collaboration with project longevity new haven and the urban league of southern connecticut 
beginning this coming Saturday, the 5th at noon for their cultural academy for four Saturdays over Zoom. They're going to be discussing how the word is passed, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America by Clint Smith. I'm putting that link in the chat. And then on the 16th, I'll be chatting with um, Sandro Galea. I'm just gonna reach for this about his book, The Contagion Next Time, um, where he addresses the way our country has handled the pandemic that we're in right now and um, including uh, social justice implications and lessons that we can take into the future um, to better handle the next crisis. Information on both of these and all of our events is available on our website at nhfpl.org. And I just wanna thank you again, Gabriella. It was such a beautiful novel. Um, I'm hoping to read it again soon. It was so great. Um, and I hope that you continue writing and maybe come join us again next time. One of thank you so much. Us. Yeah, it was such a pleasure um, to be here. And thank you everyone for your questions and for engaging with my book so, so beautifully. So thank you.